Here we go. So I'm Stephanie, and uh, I, I guess I'm the founder of the Women of AR group. And thanks a lot, everyone, for being here. We found these race debriefings to be uh, super helpful and educational for people. And one of the things we really want to do with this one is um, not only talk about worlds, that particular race, but also give people an idea about what the AR World Series is and talk kind of more broadly about expedition racing and international racing, because I know that's something a lot of the women in our group are super curious about. So this is going to be a little broader discussion than we typically have with one of our race um, debriefings. And so we're super excited to have the CEO of the Adventure Race World Series with us, Heidi Mueller. And we've also got Chelsea Magnus from Team um, Quest AR Bend Racing. We're, we're racing together at Worlds this year. And then hopefully, um, we're also going to have Emily uh, Casaria, who is on the Quest and Bend team. Hopefully, she's going to be able to join us. If not, we'll... Uh, We'll spend a little more time with Chelsea and Heidi. But so we're going to start out with Heidi and just a really quick bio from her. Heidi's in South Africa and um, started racing more than 20 years ago with her husband, Stefan. And uh, after they had kids, they pivoted to organizing races. And Heidi's passion when she organizes a race is to really showcase the best that a region has to offer. And if you look up race reports from their signature race, Expedition Africa, you'll know she's been really successful in that mission. Um, and her success was recognized when she was brought on as the international events and brand director of the AR World Series in 2020, and then promoted to CEO of that organization last year. Um, the Dark Zone podcast, I saw called her the most positive person on the planet. So Heidi, is that a moniker that the Dark Zone gave you or where did that come from? Um, I don't know, but yeah, I saw um, that, yeah, anyway, hello everybody, but um, yeah, that is a compliment. Um, I do think I've got a gift, a uh, gift of a positive energy and maybe just that's how I surround my life. So maybe it's just that vibrancy and positiveness and I guess I think if you're involved with adventure racing and I call it our beloved sport, I say to people, everything what we do and everything is positive. You're surrounded by positive people. If you have to organize a race or if you work with race directors, everybody is positive people. You cannot do this if, if, if you're not black. You know, you have to be sort of over positive, I think, if you, if you want to make a success of it. Um, because it's kind of a crazy world, I think, both, both, both sides to the story. But, um, and then, yeah, it just becomes natural for me. It becomes your life and you just bubble adventure racing and the true love for the sports. So yeah, so thanks for, <laughs> for the, I'm Hello, glad if you I'm think I'm the most that. positive person. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit about the AR World Series. Like how does the series work? How does the championship work? What are all those moving parts that you oversee? Well, yeah, so um, maybe just to explain, we at Expedition Africa started in 2011. So like most race directors, you start organizing a race, and then you look at a bigger platform or organization where you can be part of. And, and we were exactly the same. I think just before we started, I told you, um, you know, I had a four-month-old baby and we had our first expedition race. And I never, ever thought it would be like, oh, let's do another one. And oh, let's do another one. Um, and after our first expedition race, we, we looked around the world and we thought, how can we get on a bigger platform on a place where we can get recognition or like people notice Expedition Africa and obviously we found a World Series at that time. And that, I mean, how many, 11 years back. Um, and we joined Expedition Africa back then already. We joined AO World Series. So it became that we were members how many years back. And obviously through the years, you just grow and you start knowing the organization. And you, what we did as race directors is we always try to go in the last five, six years to all the world championship events. So we actually took it as our investment. We decided that's the way to promote Expedition Africa by traveling to let's say my children were Banner was like one years one and a little bit years old and Isabella was four months I was four months pregnant with Isabella. And we went to the raid in France. And you know when you go to these other world championships you learn, you see, you observe you meet people and you say oh come to africa and 
And that is how we basically promoted Expedition Africa and became part of the bigger brand of meeting all the other race directors. I never at that point in time realized or even thought about that I will get involved in the World Series. So at that point, it was just to promote Expedition Africa. Um, so yes, AR World Series, obviously over the last few years, Craig has asked me if I can get, several times asked me if I can get involved. And, you know, every time I was either in 2019, we actually had two big races. We organized our race on the island of Rodrigues. And that year we had a race where we organized Expedition India in, in, in India, which was very, very difficult to, to organize two races very far from home. And um, already then I said, no, I'm, you know, I'm too busy. I can't take something else on. Obviously, we all know we're moms, we've got children, other responsibilities. It's really hectic. Um, but I think it was sort of started there, the idea of me getting more involved with AR World Series. So basically, in a nutshell, AR World Series is a, is a platform that has an organization that has been created and developed over the years. Um, of where the, the platform's goal is to find and unite different races around the world to, to, to get a, a place where we can list all these events and, and work together and collaborate and share. Um, you know, we can get over the years that develop the referee system, over the years that develop the rankings. And as we go forward, we develop um, and acknowledge that there's a lot of things we can do to make better. We are not a federation or you know organization in that sense we are purely it, it, it is a business where we come together and we try to get and connect other races that wants to be part of this global platform um and like i said recently we'll see we added in the regional races you know it's another tier of shorter distance races um and yeah we've just got more and more wonderful ideas to to unite races around the world so that maybe the guy in america can now start looking and say, oh, wow, there is um, wonderful races happening in Africa and South Africa or in Australia and in Europe, um, in South America, where maybe a few years back you would not even look at races in South America. And the same thing happens now with guys in, in Europe. They say, oh, wow, America's got a healthy network of races and, and you know, like all these things are happening around the world. So our goal is just to expand the awareness, the marketing platform, and obviously develop and improve races. Obviously look at races and say, how can we make it better? How can we make it more professional? Um, and, and just, I think from my side is basically just ignite that feeling of striving for excellence. Um, and yeah, I mean, I can speak about it forever, but that is what AR World Series, you know, that is what we are, that is what we're trying to achieve. Um, and that is how we obviously are connected with Chelsea and them and, and, and the US and some of the other race directors. But um, yeah, that is our World Series. It seems to me, uh, from a racer perspective, one of the things that makes ARWS appealing is it feels like it would make it a little less intimidating to go try to race internationally because I would have some expectation of consistency. It gives me some idea of what to expect. And so because an event was part of this larger organization, it feels to me like that would make things a little more reliable, a little more predictable. And so if I'm going to invest in, you know, traveling abroad and going to this big, huge race, I feel like I've got some structure behind it that I know I can count on. So how do you go about selecting um, a race organizer or, or a race to be part of the ARWS? How did you select Paraguay for world championships this year? So how it normally works is, and I'm, an, I'm now involved for the last year, so there has been some races that's already been involved before my time. But how it works basically is most of the times a race director will contact a World Series. Most of the times I get weekly races that contact us. And, and say, we would like to be part. And I mean, some of the races are longer races, some are shorter races. And what I basically now do is you sort of investigate the race, the race director, you investigate how many years have they organized it. Is it somebody who's for the first time starting to organize races and you still need to a little bit develop and grow it? Or is it some, um, you know, what is their backing and what is their goal? So it's a, it is a process where where you have to look at the race director. I mean, of course, it's a little bit easier if the race director has organized some races in the past and been doing it for a few years, and they have been 
you know, got a rankings or a result or video films and, and we can go and look at it. Um, so now we have the, the challenge for AI World Series is also because we, we've started with the qualifiers, if you can look at that. And the idea was in certain countries, for instance, let's say Croatia, we have one race director in one race in Croatia. So it is impossible for us to organize in a qualifier distance to organize and put into one country two or three races because it's a small country. We're in America, for instance, now you can see we div divided it into different sort of areas where they're a little bit in different, um, you know, um, areas in America because the country is so big and we try to collaborate and say different timings. But ultimately, it is difficult with some of the races. You know, they, it's one race a month. Um, you try to spread it over the world. We are the races. And then you if you can look now at the World, World Series site and at the calendar for next year, you will see that there are a different spread of races all around the world. So yes, it's normally one race per, per country. Um, and typically, like look at Africa, we the Expedition Africa race. That race pay a licensing fee and they have the full right to decide after a year, you know, they don't want to be part anymore or like, Let's say Pablo has organized races now for over 10 years in Spain. Pablo has said he's now retiring or he's putting it off for another year to take a bit of a rest. So that is kind of how the process works. So if, if, if there is a race director who's not in a country, for instance, and it's a new country, it opens, of course, a space for somebody to come in and say, I want to be part of um, a World Series. And then I basically go back and collaborate, look at the history, like I said, uh, see where we can help. And that is just to get a new race in. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about people who have been organized races for many years, and now they become part of AOL series. We still do a demonstration race. You will see like this year with Abigail, um, Abby and, and Brent and them, you know, they had a demonstration race. It's kind of your first race where you want to get into the system of AOL World series. And we, we give you a little bit of guidance. We, we give you that exact platform, like you say, we have a referee, we have a system. But still, I think it's important that people realize that I think the uniqueness of AI World Series is that we are all different. It is not an Iron Man concept. We don't own the races. It is not an Iron Man we do, and we just copy the Iron Man in another country. Um, I think it is wonderful to have uh, ultimately, it's different individuals who organize it and they ultimately have different styles. You can clearly see if you look at America, America does got a different style of, 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 of racing within America. We're comparing, for instance, typical with, with Africa, we have more expedition style kind of, kind of racing. But that is the beauty of it. Because if you're an event race and you ultimately want to race at different places, um, but again, like you say, you know at least the race has some credibility or um, there is a World Series are trying their best, or I am definitely trying my best to put pressure on our race directors to, to have a certain things to follow through and checklist and make sure you have this, make sure you've got that, let's check that, how can we make it better? And I'm talking from where you meet your teams at the airport to dropping them back at the airport. Um, but anyway, so again, that is a system. And how did Paraguay got the world champs to get to that question of yours? Basically, how it works within a World Series, you as a race director should have at least a few years of experience. Um, we should have, have got the confidence that you have had enough races under the belt or experience from both sides that you bring up your name forward and you say, we, it's like a bidding process, but you bring up forward and you say, we would like to host it in that year. Then what AI World Series does is I look at all the, the RDs in front of me and mostly in all the years, there will always be around two or three people that indicates that they're interested in organizing it. And, and that is the time when I start looking, collaborating and say, okay, this is how it works. Um, can you host it? How can we make it better, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can decide, Hopefully, we don't have to bid against another country. Um, but there has been years before me where it was two or three race directors that wanted to host the race, and we called in all the RDs to make a decision which one is going to host the race or not. So Paraguay was selected before my time already. Um, 
it was in 2019, and I don't know if you recalled, then it was supposed to be Sri Lanka, then there was the bombings in Sri Lanka, and that couldn't happen. And then remember, Spain was already selected as the world champs, and then it was moved over to 2021. So um, they have been, Gustavo have been organizing races for over 10 years as well. Actually, Gustavo, his first adventure race, his expedition race was in South Africa. Um, we already then told me, Heidi, I'm going to host the World Chats one day before you. And we had this little thing, who's going to host it the first time. But that gives you an idea what we're talking about. We're giving it's a, somebody who's had 10 years of love and dedication towards adventure racing. He has over good years and bad years organized the race. He's got a company. He pulled in Urts in the last few years to, to be the course director. Um, so it's not just somebody who stands up one day and saying he wants to host the World Champs. So does a team have to qualify in order to go to the AR World Championships? Well, in the past we had. We have where we say teams have to qualify. Now, Certain people, um, you know, qualification is you just need to be able or you have done one of the other AO World Series races. I think um, in the last two years, when, especially when COVID came, it wasn't anymore where we said, listen, that is a strict, um, um, how can I say, we can't enforce it so strictly because there were times where teams or people could not have done races. But the ultimate aim will be that a person or a team must at least indicate in some way that they have done an expedition race somewhere in the team or at least the minimum of two members in the team that they will be up to to such a, a long distance race. I think also in that regard specifically, that's what Gustavo and them did in Paraguay to give some of their local teams an opportunity also to be part of it. And they were worried that they're not part of it and they would not be able to do the full course. They did create a, a, a little bit of a shorter version for local, especially for local teams that want to be on the starting line. They celebrate adventure racing and want to grow the sport in their own country, but they want to give them opportunity to race. And they've entered them for the shorter course race as well, together with the um, full course, which Chelsea and them are posted. Okay. So let's move to Chelsea. It looks like um, Emily hasn't been able to join us yet. So I'm going to skip through to Chelsea um, and welcome Chelsea Magnus to the uh, to the stage here. So Chelsea is part of the dynamic duo. I know everyone on this call knows. Um, formerly Yoga Slackers and now Bend Racing. She and Jason adventure race around Bend, Oregon with their wild boys, Max and Revel. And uh, Chelsea began adventure racing in 2008. She has countless expedition races under her belt. She won the women's title at the Wimbo America's Solo 24-Hour Mountain Bike Championship this year. And uh, she and Jason not only organize amazing races that follow more of this expedition and journey type format, but they also host workshops and camps. They coach and train racers from beginners to elite athletes. So if you're interested in um, getting into adventure racing or stretching into some longer expedition style races and you'd like some coaching along those lines uh bend racing and, and chelsea can help you out there so chelsea can you give us kind of a race overview of world champs in paraguay this year maybe talk about how um, it compared to some other world champs that you've done in previous years yeah, yeah. First off, I am in the middle of hosting an adventure race camp. So if you hear some mumbling, some people are in the next room going over maps right now. So excuse me for that. Um, when I'm not talking, I'll put it on mute. Um, but yeah, uh, I've done a couple world championships now. And um, I was particularly excited to go to Paraguay because of Ertzi. Ertzi has been to a couple of our races here in Oregon, Expedition Oregon. Um, and we've, you know, we've been uh, competing against Ertzi for a long time and friends with him. And after every race, we kind of compare notes about the race because I feel like Ertzi and Jason, because um, Jason does our course designing, I feel like they have kind of that same mind when it comes to putting on races and racing and the style of racing that they like. And um, so even though we don't come from, you know, our languages aren't the same, we still are able to communicate. Um, and uh, I remember after Spain, he was like, Chelsea, come to Paraguay. 
it's like, there's going to be dirt. It's going to be good. There's going to be navigation. And um, so we were really excited to, to go there. Um, and the, yeah, I feel like with uh, Paraguay, it was a country that I'd never really heard of before. Um, it was um, it near Brazil, which I was a little scared of because I had a, 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 quite an experience in Brazil at that world championships. Um, so I was a little scared of the heat, especially going with Dan. If you've watched Eco Challenge, you know Dan um, has not been so well in the heat, with, but we've been heat training for a couple of years now after Eco Challenge and figuring some stuff out. Um, and so, yeah, we felt ready and excited to go. And the weather was actually really good there, I thought. Um, we went through an awesome rainstorm and lightning storm. And um, the course was really, I feel like the course was really well thought out. The first couple sections weren't really nav heavy, but then the last four or five section was really interesting, I feel. Um, a course of like nav choices that you could make. And I feel like it was a bit challenging at times, um, especially at, at night. And um, the route I feel was really interesting, um, especially, and for me, I'm not the um, lead navigator, not even the second navigator, um, but for me as, um, you know, a racer, I felt like I was really um, just, uh, yeah, intrigued and excited the whole time. Um, so I feel like it was a really good AR championships. So one of the questions I was going to ask Emily, let me make sure I ask you, because I think a lot of people will be interested to know this. One of the most, it seems to me, intimidating things about thinking about racing abroad, um, and especially in a country uh, where the first language is not English, which is my first language, um, what do you do to prepare in terms of like researching the area? How do you learn about the venue and the weather and maybe access to food? I would be worried. Are they going to have the race food I need? Do I need to pack my own water? Like, can you talk a little bit about how you think about getting ready for a race in another country where you've never been before? Yeah. Yeah. I've raced um, around the world in many different countries now. And at first, our team was always into just studying just everything about, about the country. But as we got kids and a bit less time. Um, we focused on certain things and that is we focused on the weather. So we kind of look at the weather trends and see what it's going to be like. And as far as language goes, um, we always know that if it's not the first language of, of ours, that it's going to be maybe a little bit more difficult. Um, so over the past, last couple of years, I've been, I was, I studied Spanish in high school and was actually lived abroad for a little bit. So I just kind of tried to up my studies more on Spanish so that I could at least get by and get my team through and in, in towns that we pass through or ask for things that we needed food and such. Um, but if the route book is in, you know, both, then I make sure to ask the race director. So um, for me, I had contact with Ertzi. And so before the race, he sent out some uh, some notes, some course book notes, um, and they always send out the, um, the route, not the route book, but just like what the course highlights are going to be and some notes on it. Then I wrote to the race director or Ertzi, I wrote to Ertzi and asked some questions, some specific questions that I had. Um, like he said that we would have to maybe pay off some people. And I was like, oh, that's a red flag. Like, okay, what language do I have to have? Like, what words should I learn to talk to the locals if I need to do that? Um, and so I always just kind of like, once they send out the notes on the course, then um, my role on the team is to kind of research that point. But I don't spend much time beforehand researching things that aren't going to come up because I don't know where it's going to be in the country. So it's just like, it doesn't really matter. Um, the other thing that we do is we do look up the, the maps. So if they don't send out an example of the maps, then we ask for that. But Ertzi did for Paraguay. He sent out um, past maps just so that um, Dusty and Dan could look at those and kind of see what his map style was going to be. That's huge because that's what you're looking at for the whole time. 
Um, also, we learned from the Spain race. Uh, in Spain, we raced with Lars, and Lars had done that race before. And he told us that the route book was really, really um, important in Spain, in, in um, Pablo, um, Pablo's races. And so we studied that um, as soon as we got it in Spain. We studied that. Um, and we had it with us at all times because we knew that that was going to be huge. And so for us, we really kind of, um, we either talk to other racers who have gone to that race before, um, or we talk to the race director and kind of try to learn this style, or we try to go the year before, a couple years before they might host world championships and go to their race to figure out what their race style is. Um, and the good thing is that the adventure race community is so friendly and so nice. And so we could just post on a venture race discussion group or reach out to um, a South African team for next year and be like, hey, we haven't been to um, Heidi and Stefan's races. What's it like? And they would tell us because that's kind of the people that we are, which is great. Um, and so that's kind of what we focus on now is the maps. Um, if it's in a different language, then we try to learn some key words that will help us through, like help us find water and food, um, find lefts and rights and what a road is in that language, like certain words. Um, and then we study like the maps, if we can get a hold of a map from that race from past years. And we see like what their style is. Is it going to be a passport? Is it going to be pictures um, for the passport? Like what is what are the checkpoints going to look like? Um, and that's kind of what we focus on, if that makes sense. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I'll tell you that um, I did some mountaineering down in Mexico one time with a friend of mine, and he said, you really only need to know three words in Spanish to get by on this mountain. It's hola, cerveza, and gracias. <laughs> he was a big beer drinker. Um, <laughs> So, which leads me to my next question. So when you pack for an expedition race internationally, um, are you just packing all of the food that, I know you all use the four hour fuel, so that's probably really efficient packing wise, but yeah. what do you take in terms of, of food to be able to know you're gonna have food that will you'll be able to tolerate over those days? Yeah. Well, yeah, these days we do use the four hour fuel. One of the reasons is because it's so light and it's packable and you can take a lot of it. Um, and it's 800 calories. You know that one package is 800, 800 calories. Um, and we like it. We've tested it. So we know it works well with us. And then the other part of the food that we take is an emotion is emotional food. So for me, it's licorice, right? Um, and also we really have fun with, we love to travel. Like that's one of, one of the main, main reasons why we adventure race is because we love travel and we love to see different parts of the world in this different way that many humans don't get to see it. So, and we like to eat. So we like to experience the different cultures through food. So we'll go to their grocery stores and we'll be like, oh, this is cool. You know, like when I went to Paraguay, there was cookies there that reminded me of Patagonia because they had the same cookies. And I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. This is really because I have a deep connection to Patagonia. So that was nice for me. Um, so, yeah, we always leave room to buy food there that is distinct to their culture. And we always bring money when we're racing, especially if the course says, hey, you're going to go through little towns. And that's really fun for us is to stop at little stores and buy stuff. It just lifts the mood of the team. Um, and then we bring freeze dried meals um, because that's we always, you know, like eat that type of food and the four hour fuel. Um, so yeah, we, we always leave room to buy food there, but we take as much as we can with the food that we know that we like. So speaking of money, you mentioned having to pay off locals. Um, I know that this is something that, oh, one yeah. second. Yeah. Is it, maybe there's someone you can introduce us to. Nice we to love you kids on this show. Okay. Yeah. You want to come say hi? Okay. I don't want to. <laughs> There's this is them. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, go to Papa, please. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. What was the question? No, that's okay. So we hear about um, you see often on some of these expedition races internationally that 
getting assistance from locals and what you call paying off locals is a pretty common thing. That's really foreign to us in typical races in the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and how it works? Yeah, it actually didn't happen to us in Paraguay. Ertzi just said that it might, he had a route, a specific route planned and he had, you know, to, um, made deals with these landowners um, that, you know, that we could cross over their fences. We crossed over so many fences in Paraguay. That's a skill that you have to <laughs> learn and in, in, is like crossing over, bringing your bikes up and over barbed wire, like, I don't know, like thousands of times, you know, and we got a system down. So that's another thing. But so he, you know, worked with these landowners, which in the States, we do it differently. I mean, as we know, in the States, it's very different. And if you go into trespass zone, it's very bad. Um, and so he was like, you know, Chelsea, don't worry about it if you're going to bring money for food anyways. And so it'll just be a little bit of money if you go off in the wrong, a little bit of the course that I didn't think that you'd go. We didn't do that. So it wasn't a problem. Um, but like in Fiji, Jason was saying, I didn't go get to go to Eco Challenge. But in Fiji, they were, that was a known thing is that you, in, that you would just pay guides to help carry your gear on donkeys. Um, and help help you lead the way through these many, many different jungle trails. So it's just kind of a part of it. And like Heidi was saying, every race is different because you're working with your own culture your, and it's your own style and you're working with your people and, you know, little towns like in us in Bend, we go out to, you know, three hours east of here and we're working with ranchers who aren't always the nicest, but some of them are. And, you know, that's like when Lars comes to race here, one of our teammates, he's like, oh my gosh, this is such an experience of America and like seeing the cowboys and everything where we're just like, whatever, this is just it. But for people internationally who are coming, that's a really cool thing to experience. So that's what we now try to look at is like, oh, okay, this is an experience for international racers. For us, anyways, when we're just taking money, we mostly think about it for paying for food. Um, and honestly, like if you, yeah, it's good to know a few words in the language of knowing how to go different ways. And sometimes those people will ask for money and we're very privileged to be in their country racing and we're adventure racers. So it's like, yeah, I'm gonna give them a few dollars or offer it. But, you know, in Paraguay, the people were so nice. I we used a couple of people's bathrooms or, um, you know, went into their store at odd hours of the night because they're open and we're like, hey, can we give you some money because um, you helped us? And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't want it. Or somebody met us in the middle of it seemed like a middle of nowhere might have not been for them and like gave us fresh squeezed orange juice. And we're like, can we give you money? Like and they were like, no, no, no. But it's always I feel like it's always good to have money just in case because it's just, if you don't know the language that well, it's just a nice gesture to have. And we have, we have it and it's not much money for us. So it's just, yeah, for different cultures, I feel like it's a nice tool to have. Yeah. And so, to know, to say thank you in, thank you um, in another language is very important, I feel. Yeah. So I'm still intrigued by the idea that you could have a donkey carry your gear. I've got Sarah Dahlman. I'm not comparing Sarah Dahlman to a donkey, except to the extent that she's strong as hell and can climb mountains and she carries my stuff. Yeah, um, she is. And so I'm, I'm curious then, is it sort of, is it one of those things where the race director is going to tell you in advance that this is acceptable or is it a situation where if they don't say it's forbidden, then it's considered acceptable. Like what's the sort of understanding in international racing as far as getting assistance in that respect, like actually having someone else carry your gear? The race director tells you in advance. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because there has been instances where it had where it is forbidden and it and they do tell you. Um, so yes, yeah. You like you know. And that's also something good to ask the, the race director at the race meeting, or if there's not a race meeting, you go up to, right to the race director and you ask, because yeah, I asked Ertzi about that. And so it's just very clear um, of what you can and can't. And I get, I wasn't in Fiji, but it was very known thing that you, that uh, that was part of the race was to give money to the locals and get help from them. Like you, 
you know, I, I saw many racers, even in Paraguay, go in and give money to locals because they slept on their living room floor or on their porch. And that was like a known thing that you can do. You can't have outside assistance of know, of people knowing that you were in the race and helping you in that way. But locals who had no idea about the race helped help you in. That's totally fine. So yeah, it's, it's not a big thing about the adventure racing in, internationally, but it's a, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. And so, yeah, you want to know the ins and outs of, of it, because I know that there was maybe Heidi can talk to it, but there was an instance in um, Ecuador where, um, you know, somebody got directions and followed a boy and that was very forbidden and known that it was, that it, it, that was against the rules. So. So Heidi, why don't you jump in and tell us what, what the standards are there? It sounds like it's probably going to be something very specific to a given race and race director, but what are your what what is ARWS's position on that and feelings about it? Yes, it is. Um, you know, there's a the standard ARWS series rules which we try to make standards right through the world. Um, but again, it is like Charles would say that there might be a certain race specific. We also get event rules. So there are definitely a, a kind of a two sets of rules. Um in general, within our World Series and all our races around the world, it is like Charles would say, it's no outside assistance. So that is definitely um, the ruling for that will be like nobody can help you. You can't um, get a family member booking accommodation for you every night when you go kind of thing or bringing you a Coke around the corner. The standard outside assistance things we know of. Um, but yes, exactly what happened in Ecuador in certain races, there are these sort of blurred lines, things that happens here and there. And we should really try with our race directors to make sure that the, the races understand clearly what in that specific country is allowed and not allowed. Um, I even myself know when Eco Challenge, when Fiji came out, a lot of people will say, but oh, that was paid for a donkey to carry your stuff. And, you know, was those lines also not a little bit blurred? Um, or carrying your backpack and that kind of stuff. In a normal adventure race, it's not allowed. It, you know, it, it is, um, but we try to make it clear, and I know specifically in, in our races in Africa, we, we say exactly what is assistance um, and that forth. But again, I mean, when we get to walking into a shop and buying a cool drink or sleeping on the floor of somebody, um, those things are 100% permitted. And like Chelsea say, you do get specific event rules where the race director will say if something is allowed. Um, to give it a good example, in Lesotho this year in South Africa, we, for instance, um, teams had a mountain bike leg and then you arrived at a river. And at that river, you had to get over with a local boat. So you had to pay the local guy. We actually arranged and asked him, will you please stay awake 24 hours? And we said to him, we promise you these people are going to give you some money. You're going to make more money than you've made your whole life. So, um, you know, then they did help all the kids. If you've seen any of the footage, you will see there were, I think, like 50 plus children eventually on their way back also to school. And they had to get over this river. And they just started helping, putting everybody's bikes on these boats. And it was actually a big thing. Um, so, yeah, and that event specifically we have to allow it because there's no other way for the teams to get over than swimming this dangerous river. And, the, and, and you know, it was raining and stuff. So, um, yeah, so it's just event specific rules. Um, I think the biggest situation which Charles has been speaking about is to make sure, especially if the language of the race is not English, um, so that people can clearly understand. Even now I've implemented, a, you know, an own rule in our world series that I have to see your race book. You know, I have to see, you know, so I can understand it as well and mail back to the race director if I don't understand it or their translations are not good. Um, we have now translators that can help the race directors, and it's mostly with those. It's mostly when it comes to the Spanish or the French, um, um, you know, translations. But the same thing applies. And if if we write something in English, and Chelsea will see now that more international people will come to the USA races, you you write it in English, but still the French or the Spanish people don't understand. And the moment if you want to start, start, and I say that the whole time to the, especially to the US that, um, race directors, if you want the French and the Spanish team to come to your race, in some way you'll need to show them that you are inviting them. You need to translate your press releases. 
I mean, now for me, for, for the world champs in South Africa, all my press releases I translate in, into, France, uh, into French and into Spanish. So you can show them that you do cater for them, you do look after them, you'll try to support them, you must have translators. And that is the next step of race organization to go to. But yeah, back on the ruling list, um, it's a big debate. Yes, Stephanie. Well, that actually segues really nicely into the one of the questions I had for you, which is to talk a little bit about the diversity of teams that come to Worlds, um, both geographic diversity and also ability and fitness levels and what some of your observations are um, from covering the middle and the back of the pack teams. We all know who those, you know, top of the pack teams are. I'm curious what your observations are about the teams in the middle and the back of the pack and specifically at Paraguay sort of what did you observe among the teams that were able to finish successfully and the teams that ended up dropping? And um, I think Paraguay was wonderfully, there was a lot of diversity. I mean, if you just look at the top 10 teams, they were all basically from nearly from different countries. So that was amazing. And I mean, you can even take it to, to the next team. Um, so a lot of diversity amongst the teams um, from different countries. And again, that's why the language is such a big thing. Um, for, for to make sure that the, the, the teams can understand the instructions and have an open policy to be able to ask the race director to explain. Um, I think the big thing what happened in Paraguay is that because there was definitely a big group of the local and they tried to promote local and South American adventure racing. So they're definitely coming out of COVID. Um, and, and I think you need to look at the world and where the world is now. You know, they, they, I'm sure they would have wanted more teams to go to the numbers of 80 plus and they, they had into the 70s and then it was also some of them were in the short course. But that opened an avenue for them to have more South American teams and Spanish speaking teams and local teams. And I was very, very surprised with the quality of racing. If you look at, and I mean, Chelsea will, and everybody who followed the race, that was a heavy navigation course. Um, where we always have the philosophy when you say an adventure race, if you look at your four main disciplines, it's mountain biking, trekking, um, kayaking, and navigation. And it needs to play equally. That is how I see it. It needs to play an equal part in the race. Um, it should not be, um, you know, it's not a orienteering race, and it should not be a mountain bike race. It's, you know what I mean? We need to make sure that it's got the four equal parts into that race. And um, I, I would definitely say in this race, the navigation was heavy and the teams were incredible. The quality of the teams, you know, we found teams in the course. And I'm talking about 12, top 15 to 20 teams. And, and people were heavily struggling with the navigation, especially at night. You could clearly, clearly see when a team, and I could even see that for our own South African team, um, where we were waiting specifically for them at a particular spot. And the moment when the darkness fell and, and I mean, I could see where the point is and I'm like, come on guys, come on. And then it got dark and suddenly where they were five minutes away from a point, suddenly it was like over an hour. Um, that is how difficult, people don't understand how difficult the navigation was and at night with the jungles and, and small parks. So I really, the teams were incredible. And the, um, um, the level of racing was incredible um, to see all the teams and Chelsea, you guys, was, I mean, of course, you did incredibly. We can get to that point as well. How amazing you did as two women in the team. Hi, Emily. We've just been talking how amazing you girls are. Um, so, you know, Stephanie, the teams that pulled out, I have to say to you, it's not, you don't pull out at a World Champs because we don't like each other. Or we had a fight. You, you pull out purely what I've seen at World Champs, the teams that we've seen as seriously injuries or foot problems or diarrhea. You know, somebody really got very sick. And it's out of medical reasons that they pulled out. But it's definitely not because, listen, I'm not, I'm not in the mood to race anymore. This is too hard for me. Um, people do tend to, especially in this, in this route, there was enough short course options and the teams could make their way forward and maybe drop one team member, the sixth member, and they could make themselves to the finishing line. 
it was very rare and and you know here and there people that dropped out purely because like i said it was a medical issue or maybe it's a husband and and wife couple and then the wife got sick and then the husband will say he will pull out with his wife as well kind of thing but the rest of the team will got continue so um i was very i was very surprised And Kylie's frozen up. <laughs> we knew that she was having um, connection issues. She has no power right now in South Africa. I know Emily didn't hear that. So she's been on a generator and maybe we had a little issue with that, but that's okay. It gives us a chance to welcome Emily to the group. I know Emily is working today, so she's taking a break to join us. Thanks, Emily. And I'll introduce you really quickly. She's up in Bellingham, Washington. And uh, Emily started racing in 2013 when her husband, Dusty, uh, found this race that Quest AR was putting on. And so they tackled their first race together. You weren't married at the time, um, but married since then. So um, Emily races with her husband, Dusty, and Brent and some others on Team Quest AR. And uh, I think that Emily's first expedition race was at God Zone in New Zealand in 2017, and your team took 10th overall, which is kind of incredible for your first <laughs> expedition race. And then the next year, you raced Expedition Oregon with uh, Chelsea's crew out there, and you were third overall. Um, and so I know Expedition Oregon was an ARWS demonstration event that year, which Heidi was just telling us about. And then it became an official ARWS event in 2019 when Quest took first overall, um, which was, was pretty amazing. And then I know you did, your next race was Raid Galicia last year, which took you about six days and your team finished that. Is that the longest expedition race that you've had? um yeah it was well it was probably it was the longest because we did um worlds in wyoming in 2017 as well and we took i think five and a half days maybe six days for that too wow okay um, and so, so that was the longest we've been out okay and so then the paraguay race this year you and chelsea race um on a combined team um, with Dan from Bend and your husband, Dusty, from Quest. And you all were seventh overall this year. And that's the best placing for an American team at, at an AR World Championships. Is that right? Um, I I know AMK was up in the top 10 before. Um, AMK, for got, sure. AMK got third one year. Um, yeah. The difference was they were racing um, Brad and Rob Preston from Australia. So you could say that we're the highest full... American squad um, yeah. that yeah that has placed that high um AMK that year was I think three um Americans with Rob or two Americans a Swede Olaf may might have been on that team and then yeah Rob. Olaf was on their team yeah yeah so yeah and he's he's Swedish and American so yeah. probably <laughs> went with American citizenship and then Rob was the true uh, Australian yeah. So Emily, how long were you all out there this year? Uh, was was it five and a half days, Chelsea? <laughs> it was a hundred and twenty-seven hours. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was um. Yeah, it was our you know as long as about Wyoming or so. So it was like our second ish longest time being out on a course, but our best finish in an expedition race that Dusty and I have ever done and so, so what do you think were the keys to your all success this year uh we all were on the same page as far as wanting to you know be in the top 10 shoot for top five you know uh just really um wanted to compete and see how high we could get uh we all were on a similar training program especially later in the summer and we were kind of you know, we were on a, a training program with Chelsea and Dan um, that Jason Magnus had kind of come up for us uh, leading up to the race. And then we had some good training before the race just to kind of see like how we all mesh together and what our like, especially like naving like uh, Dan and Dusty together. And they did awesome um, on our little training we did down in Bend, uh, all four of us. And 
we just went in with um, a lot of just good, I don't know, team communication, um, same goals, and a lot of just kind of debriefing on different things. So I'd say, yeah, communication was huge. And then team training together uh, made a big difference. And then, yeah, the goals, same goals going in for sure was key. And so what was your sleep strategy and how much did you sleep over this five and a half days? Uh, we slept seven hours, seven and a half hours. Um, and sleep strategy was first night we didn't sleep. Second night we, we uh, slept, uh, we ended up sleeping maybe closer to two hours just because there was a major like, you know, uh, lightning, thunder, rainstorm. Um, and then the third, third night we slept another 90 minutes, fourth night we slept another 90, basically it was 90 minutes every night except for that second night. Um, I think the math's right on that. <laughs> and uh, we did sleep the last night. Um, and I think that was a great strategy. Um, we saw a lot of teams on that last trek just run around for hours. Um, like the Swedish Armed Forces team and the uh, Estonia spent like 10 hours or something at least on that last stage. And we were able to do it in, I think it was around five and a half or something hours. Um, and I mean, we did it during the daytime and we slept the night before. I think that played a huge role in just like being clear uh, for that last stage, especially because as the race progressed, the navigation got more technical, which um, was kind of a cool way uh, to, I guess, organize it because um, it made it kind of challenging and strategy different strategy than a lot of other races, I think. So uh, I thought that was a smart part on the team's part to get some sleep and um, really nail that last really difficult stage. And so what were some of the highlights of Paraguay for you? Um, the, there was a lot, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, it was a beautiful country. I wasn't expecting to see as much, um, really cool, like there was these cool green birds, um, I'd never seen in the wild before. I don't know what they were even, but there was this huge, like, uh, I don't know if you call it a flock, a swarm, um, or it wasn't a gaggle. So just a ton <laughs> of these birds. Um, I know that was a special spot for Chelsea as well but um yeah the birds were really cool um and the the sunrises and sunsets were just phenomenal um our team like camaraderie was really fun and i've never i mean i've had fun in races before this was just uh yeah an extra special time just um to really click well with team uh, teammates and just kind of overcome adversity and uh just like push the whole time um and zip lining was fun um the paddling was pretty exciting uh just with being overnight and like big lightning storm and dumping rain and um i was steering dusty in my boat which i normally don't do unless it has a rudder so that was a really good um confidence booster for me um and that was kind of neat to like complete that stage and do okay but so what yeah. led to that change why were you in this race if that wouldn't typically be your setup uh dusty was navigating that section and it's easier for the navigator to especially in a boat without a rudder to um just have the map in his lap and just be paddling instead of trying to steer as well because then you kind of have you have to let go of the paddle to look at the map and then your boat just goes everywhere so yeah and so yeah, you talked but it about worked out well. Yeah, sorry. You talked about overcoming adversity. What were some of the obstacles that you all overcame in the course of this race? Um, there was a bunch of like just little things that came up like normal, like, I don't know, um, little, really not really many nav issues, honestly, like felt like the guys did really well on the nav. Um, 
and then just like some tricky uh but there was tricky navigation where like there was a waterfall checkpoint and um it just kind of got off shot a little bit and then um this can happen in long races you know like you start kind of spreading out as a team you know we had two navigators and they both had a, a map and you know just kind of go in a different direction like oh it's around here let's like go look and then you know chelsea and i are like okay he went that way and he went that way like let's keep an eye on them and make sure they don't get too far and it was kind of one of those moments um we kind of just had like a we finally found the waterfall checkpoint but it took us an extra i don't remember how long maybe 20 minutes or something um and then we had just like a hey guys like let's come back together and we all know we want this and we care a lot to do our best and let's stay on the horse let's stay together we're gonna stick we aren't gonna get spread out again um and we're just gonna help each other again because you know when you get tired and maybe you have a low moment for whatever reason you maybe start spreading out from your team and each person starts looking more inward like how am I going to take care of myself or start having negative thoughts like oh, I'm not doing as well as I should I feel bad I need to get better and in those moments is really when you should focus on even making proximity to your team closer because um, that helps your mental state just thinking like, okay, my team's right here. We're all together. I'm not falling off the back or, um, you know, I'm willing to hand them something because they're right there. And I don't know, it just, uh, just physical proximity makes a big difference. And I think we acknowledge just how we were all kind of feeling a little off in that moment. And then recognizing, oh, we're all feeling this way. Well, let's change that and come back together. Um, so I thought that was a, that was a pretty big turning point for our team. And uh, we ended up just, yeah, going for it the rest of the time. Um, we had just some, uh, yeah, the last the last stage we had one navigation thing, but it ended up being like Dusty took us straight to the right checkpoint, but we didn't look far enough in the cave. Um, so then we kept looking around and taking other bearings and it's like, ah, oh, we can't find it. And it was like, that was a really hard moment for all of us because we're like two checkpoints from the end and like running in circles. Um, I but, heard about this cave. You just had to keep going deeper. Yeah, right? it was like inside. Um, so yeah, that was just another kind of silly kind of mistake that can happen again near the end of a race when you're like, eyes are clouded, like we're almost done. Like, and there were photographers and we're like, oh, the photographer's by the checkpoint. And just, you know, you get distracted easier instead of like rational brain, you know, like just keep doing things like you have been. Instead, we got kind of distracted and um, ended up, you know, reeling it back in and finishing in an awesome spot. So, yeah, for sure. So will you all plan to go to Worlds next year in Africa? I know we're uh, planning on try and go into worlds if possible. We're Dusty and I um, are going to be racing with Bend Racing next year for their expedition races. Um, Quest, we've had trouble getting teammates for the longer stuff in the last few years, uh, which is why you've maybe you've seen us racing with like Jason Papilski and Chad. Um, and then we race with Mary um, for a race and we kind of have had trouble finding teammates. So it's uh, pretty awesome to be uh, joining Ben's this next year. And we had a really great experience this year, obviously. And so looking at whatever their race calendar um, holds, there's quite a few in there. So, you know, I hope to race Worlds next year for sure and see Heidi's uh, spot down there. It'd be pretty cool. Chelsea, have you done Expedition Africa? I have not done Expedition Africa yet. No, it's been on my wish list for a while. Okay, so that's your plan for next year? That's not my personal plan. Um, unfortunately, the World 24-Hour World Championships is four days after South Africa <laughs> ends, and um, it's in Australia this year. And um, they've, they're paying my way and doing all this stuff, so... I feel like I, um, especially now that we have Emily um, and, and Dusty, but, you know, Emily as a female's 
awesome too, so that I can go off to Australia, hopefully, and do that. But if it's, for some reason it falls through, I'd love to race with the same team that we did this year. So who knows? I'm, I never say like a concrete until it's, you know, a month before, because I know that lots of things can happen. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, our team is planning on going. We just don't know what the squad is, but we are hoping that Emily and Dusty are going to be two of them for sure. Yeah, cool. And now you all will be hosting Expedition Oregon again next year as part of the ARWS series? No, we are taking 2023 off okay. um, because we want to support the Endless Mountains and um, the Ozark and um, Expedition Canada. So we want to, we will be there supporting them either as a racer or um, to vent, but we really feel like we want to take a year off and just kind of um, support them. And then also we're trying to, in Bend, we're trying to grow our beginner and intermediates um, because a lot of our races have been very hard and intimidating. So we're working on that this year, um, kind of growing the community more locally. Um, and then we'll be back strong for 2024. And then fingers crossed, we get world championships in 2025. So we want to come back in 2024 so that um, if we do get the world's bid, that teams can come and try out our race in 2024. And as race directors, um, our team can kind of figure out the kinks of what we need to work on. And then 2025, we can hold the best race world championships that we can. Okay, awesome. So Heidi, it sounds like then for 2023 in the US, we've got Endless Mountains, which was a demonstration race this year. They're part of the series next year. And then Expedition Ozark is a new race that's gonna be a demonstration event. Is that right? Yes, apologies guys, I'm back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a little bit. Um, uh, Africa problems. Um, uh, yes, uh, sorry if I missed some of the conversation. Yes, it's going to be the um, the North American series. Obviously, we have, the, remember, the Canada race, Expedition Canada, and then a Rootstocks race, the Endless Mountains, and Ozark is a demonstration race. So those are, of course, with Chelsea's and race. That is sort of the American uh, series for us. Um, and we are working towards including, I'm working now with the USARA to finalize the North America regional series. And that is a typical race is where Chelsea just spoke about weekend races, you know, anything between 20 and kind of 40 hours, a race which we can fit into a weekend, but we'd like to be part of the AO World Series um, regional tier where we also get them to collaborate and start integrating and supporting each other and make those level of races also stronger. Um, so yeah, as we have now running those events in Europe, Africa, South America, and in um, Asia. So yeah, that's quite interesting. So any, are there any teasers out yet as far as Expedition Africa? What can you tell us about what racers should expect in terms of terrain and distance how long will they be out there tell us everything you can tell us about <laughs> well i can finish as well tell everybody just to follow us we are in the in the process of a lot of scouting and we normally share um you know obviously places where we go but it, it's not going to make any difference to you you won't be able to figure out the route um we also said the word route sorry and when i speak to the um americans they say route so um, sorry for the accent. Um, so yeah, just follow us. You can follow us on Instagram and on Facebook, XP Africa, and see what we do. Uh, we try to give you an idea of the host town, the village. Like today, I posted a lot of stuff about stories about the town and what people will experience and, and about everything we're doing here. Our website is updated. So all the information is on our website, um, expafrica.net. You can actually go through every division and have a look. And if there is something that people ask me, I'm like, no, I put it immediately onto the website. So I keep the website updated. We have our promotional, our teaser videos on there. And also to give people an idea, if they look at that teaser video, that's the one with a lion in the beginning to make sure you know you're in Africa. Um, that is the, because in Africa, our, our race, you know, we have got the magnificent country. So from the one province to the next province, if I can call it now, we call it province, we call it, let's say, states. 
um, it's so diverse that I cannot really use the footage of last year's race to promote this year's race. So I cannot use Lesotho because it doesn't look at all the same. So we're going on this, we, you'll see myself and Stefan, my husband, will go onto this recce. We take our filming crew with us and we'll take pieces of what you will see and encounter in the race and we'll put it into that promotional video. Um, we also live for sunrises and sunsets. As you know, in Africa, we have this magnificent vistas and it's like, Maybe that is what makes filling me up so much because if you think Emily, Paraguay was magnificent, it's going to blow your mind away, Africa. Um, it, it is just because it's so far open land and it is really, the Africa race, I think was probably how a foreigner look at it is that safari Africa, safari you have Lion King in your head. That is, the, that is Expedition Africa. That is the World Championship. Um, feeling you will get when you when you come to Africa. So we have an expedition race, traditional expedition race. It is um, no circles. Um, it is you going forward. It's a massive undertaking for us logistical wise. You can imagine our, you know, in Paraguay we were so fortunate because the logistics and for the media, you know, it, it was. Um, you know, it's a smaller country. It was a smaller area where they where they did the route where we, us we do seven hundred kilometers going forward. So from the beginning to the end, there's no way that you actually can go back on the route. Um, the logistics lines, everything had to, runs to the front. Um, so even for our logistical teams, it's a massive undertaking. For our media, it will be a massive big race to to, to manage. Um, so there are big sections of this route that is flat. And remember, in our world series, so that people also understand that we have a winning team works around hundred hours. So so if you you know hundred to to hundred and ten or so amount of hours. So we work on not only distance, but we work out also on the winning time. So if we want to get the winning teams between 100 and 110 hours in and we want to give the back teams without any cutoffs enough time to get to the finishing line we are nearly looking at 200 hours so that is why the race is very long we work on that four day margin for the top teams and we do give the back teams nine days to finish we're actually going to have only a cut on the on the last 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 day where we're going to direct the team's on a short course so that they can get to the finishing line. So really, it is really a race where um, we try to work in to make it for everybody the opportunity that you can do this race. You have enough time. Um, we do every single leg like most directors, but we do every single leg ourselves and we do it several times. Um, every, every leg in this race is private land. So we don't have big national parks, not much that we actually can put into this route. I drink tea and coffee and cookies and cream with every farmer and beg him to come over his land. And um, remember, we cannot go to private game reserves because there are animals. So we have to direct the route in a sort, certain way that you can go safely over these mountains. Like I said, just connecting private land to private land to private land that you will definitely feel. You will never see lights and towns if you see a little small farmhouse. So it, it is very remote. It is very, it is a true wilderness um, adventure. I'm very excited about it. Um, of course, we have this most beautiful small village. Um, the Cats and Francis Resort is magnificent. It's on the beach. Um, it's a fantastic place for families to bring their, their races to bring their families. It's got many swimming pools and little restaurants, and it's actually on the beach. Um, it's a wonderful safe part of our country. So while you're sitting on the beach and drink a cocktail or a cool drink and your kids are playing, your husband or the teams can race. Um, and yeah, that I don't know what else I can say. So it, it's a we're excited. It's a beautiful part of our country. Um, if the team finishes the race within, let's say, four days, I'm confident that there is so much of things to do that can, we have a spa at the resort that can just go for massages. Like I said, they can just go to the beach and relax. Um, it's a wonderful restaurant. They can eat, obviously, if you come with dollars, you know, our currency is much weaker. You can live like a king in, in Africa and South Africa. 
Um, so you have all those extra add-ons, which is great. Um, and then, uh, of course, we do extra special care. We'll pick you up at the airport. People who's been to Expedition Africa will know that we take utmost care of you. Um, we even help you. Basically, all that I've been doing the last few weeks is helping people with their onward traveling. How can they fly to Cape Town? How can they can do a safari? What can they do when they finish with a race? We had so many questions of those kind of things. And that's what I do. I help people and say what, what I think, what's the best way of traveling. Um, and yeah, so it's so an all over event. I think there's also a big element of community project, which I don't know if people know, but in our country, we have such a big need for, for, um, for help. And I'm also busy with a massive community project, which we will include in the event. And I hope my dream, it's a big dream. And I don't want to say too much yet about it, but if I can get that going, it will be very excited. We'll incorporate our athletes in, in it. Um, and of course, we will make sure it's a true African style. You'll see me even in Paraguay. I had the African attire on. I make sure I bring in the local causa. You actually say causa. You put it in your sign to the causa tribe. Is their area this, and you're celebrating the, the Corsa tribe. So we'll make sure that there's enough singing and dance and African in our event because it is a world championships in Africa. And, and I think that is why you come. A lot of people have not been in Africa and South Africa, and I feel it is part of the experience that you need to um, have everything in this race. Um, so, you know, some people come to win, and other people come to have an overall experience of, of the nature, the culture. Um, like uh, Chelsea said earlier, I mean, that's what you go for to Paraguay in these magnificent places. You, you go there for more. I always say it's more than a race. Yeah. So, yeah, so check out our site. Yes, isn't it? Very good. I was just going to say, we'll, we'll start to wrap up here. And I want to wrap up. On that note, with Chelsea and Emily, let's start with Emily because I know you're you're on your break here. So let's let's if you need to run, I want to get you in here. Um, give people an idea of just if they go to Paraguay, what what to expect, what should they look for if you were to go back to Paraguay. So often we're racing through these places and we don't have time to slow down and really appreciate it. But if you were to go back to Paraguay, what would you look for? What would you do? Um, they had really good drinkable yogurt. Um, that was a treat. Uh, and I craved it after the race a lot. Um, and then, um, the people were so friendly out in the countrysides. Um, they had little, a lot of homes had little storefronts in their homes and they'd sell little baked goods and little snacks. And, um, we stopped at one on a stage and bought a bag of cookies and, um, that was super fun. Um, and they were very friendly and they were very, they wanted to make sure like we had, we had trouble with the Guarani sometimes cause it's, uh, like 7,000 Guaranis per U S dollar. And so, you know, you're paying for things and you're like, okay, this is like, and they're speaking Spanish. So it's like, you know, a Spanish number that's very large. And, um, so buying things, you know, we had like a big bill for them. And then they had to break it for us. They're really into giving us our change. Um, but like super friendly people. Um, they had this really good soup. That was a Par Paraguayan uh, traditional dish. Super good. We got that at the host hotel. It was recommended by the waiter. Um, so yeah, their food was, was good. Um, yeah, the soup was good. And the countryside, they had a lot of waterfalls, which... I wasn't, I guess, expecting, but all, a lot of checkpoints were waterfalls and that was pretty cool to explore those. Um, so yeah, I don't know the food, the scenery was pretty and um, the yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a true adventure racers list of <laughs> things that left an impression. What about you, Chelsea? Yeah, I mean, she said a lot of the things. Um, yeah, I'm going to echo the the people. Um, whenever I go to places, I'm always really interested in how people live and um, communicating with them as best I can. Um, so that was really fun for me to be able to communicate um, in Spanish with the people and um, with gestures, with the eyes and smiles. I think that goes a long way and it's fun. 
Um, and yeah, the, the waterfalls were amazing. The ones that we saw at both night in the middle of the night and, um, in the, in the daytime were just incredible. And the sunsets and sunrises, that's, you know, that's a huge part of why Adventure Ice is being able to see so many consecutive sunsets and sunrises and seeing the sun come through the trees um, and the birds. Um, I'm very into birds. And um, so that was really awesome to see like thousands and thousands of these green, they're like parakeets, I think, or um, a form of parrot. And they're very loud, but very lively and um, woke me up at a time that was that was good for me. Good to you. All right, ladies, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate you all sharing your experience with us and Heidi giving everyone an idea of what to expect next year. It looks like we've got a message. Nima said, thank you all for sharing. And um, we've recorded this. We'll post it to the Women of AR group and uh, look forward to seeing you all at some races in the future.